Hi, I'm Andrew from Cruise Master, and today we're going to be doing a summing up video of our experience and opinions with the new Defender 110. So when the new Defender was announced, we were really excited. Everything stacked up on paper and it was potentially going to be our new rat run vehicle. Things like the 32 inch tyres, 900 kilos of payload, three and a half tonne towing, air suspension from the factory, as well as an easy clean vinyl interior. It's a perfect recipe. It really was something we were after. But just like the terrain it was designed for, it's been an up and down owning experience from the beginning. Before we get too stuck in, I'll tell you what this vehicle is. So it's our 110 Defender. From memory, it was pretty much the bottom spec we could get. It's the D240, so the higher tune of the four-cylinder engines. It's got a tow bar and tow pack, pretty standard type of thing. Terrain Response 2, which is a more advanced um, driver aid for off-road, as well as the locking differential or active torque vectoring, I think they call it. Uh, vinyl interior and the polarizing white steel wheels. The only other thing that was fitted to this vehicle from the factory was the cold climate pack. Not something that we'd spec, but was incorrectly installed um, by a Land Rover, which means we've got a nice heated steering wheel, uh, heated windscreen, all the types of things that would be excellent for the Queensland climate. Before we get too stuck into the details of our experience with the Defender, I just want to give you a bit of perspective from where we're coming from. When we're looking at these vehicles, our main focus is on towing, obviously, because that's what we do, that's our main business. So weights and capacities, how the thing tows the weight is really important to us. And then secondly, we're looking at it from the point of view of towing whilst overlanding. So one of the big uses for caravans in Australia is hitching them up behind a vehicle and heading into the bush. So that means we're typically fitting a few more things to our vehicles than you potentially see in other parts of the world. I'm talking things like bull bars and winches, roof racks with a bit of recovery gear on, maybe a solar panel up there, um, multiple spare tires, fridges in the back, two batteries, that type of thing. So all that is gonna kind of play part of, you know, how we look at the vehicle um, in particular. Um, so where does this vehicle fit with other vehicles that we've tried? So the, we're going to kind of compare it to the Land Cruiser 200 from the point of view of its three and a half ton towing and its footprint. But even though it might look small, its wheelbase and track width is actually bigger than a Land Cruiser 200, but I think in part helps its on-road and off-road stability. And then secondly, the Prado 150. And you'll see in the minutes our thoughts on the whole towing situation with the Defender. Um, the Prado is a good comparison from the point of view of a practical towing capability of this vehicle, as well as fuel economy. So this thing, this thing is far more economical than the Land Cruiser 200, more in line with the Prado. So we think it kind of sits in between those types of things. And that's kind of where our thoughts and opinions are going to come from. So the primary issue that we've had with the Defender is getting on top of the whole weight side of things. Now, in our game of um, remote towing and towing heavy caravans, weight management's a major issue, particularly um, axle capacities and GVMs and things like that. So the first thing we do when we ever get a car is we weigh it and then compare it to the factory figures just to see what type of leeway we've got. So for this particular Defender, the front axle here came out at 1,200 kilos, and the rear axle was 1,230 kilos. And this is without a driver, this is just a vehicle on its own. And that comes out to 2,430 kilos. Now, in comparison to the factory figures, which stated 2,248 kilos is what it weighs, we've lost 182 kilos of payload. So the 902 kilos of payload that Land Rover said this vehicle would have, it does not. It has 720 kilos. And that's quite a big variance. And I completely understand that every other vehicle on the market doesn't exactly come out on the curb weight specified by the manufacturer. 
Uh, Toyotas don't, for example, the Land Cruiser 200 we've seen can have 50 kilos either way of the stated numbers. And that's due to parts, tolerance, stuff like that, build variants. So this was quite a big difference. So we went back to Land Rover and said, where's all our payload gone? It's meant to be 900 kilos and it's not. So they went back to the guys in the UK and credit to Land Rover over there, they produced a really exceptional document which broke down where all the weight variants went from, the, from this particular vehicle. And here's kind of a summing up of it. So we have in this table here, it was seven and a half kilos of fuel load because we weren't 100% full at the time. The steel wheels, this was an option, so they weigh 30 kilos more in total than a set of five alloy wheels. 32 kilos of what they call Australian standard features. And they're things that are specified for the vehicle, not by us. That's things like the centre console um, in between the two front seats, the, or the advanced driver aid system, the safety gear in the vehicle, were well, all things that are not specified by us. That contributed another 30 odd kilos. From there we had the optional extras. So these were the types of the heavy things that we specified. The main two parts of that was the tow bar and the diff lock as part of the terrain response to system. But that adds another 52 kilos. And then the balance is what they called parts tolerance. That's a combination of parts don't always weigh exactly you know, what, they, what they should. They'll be a bit high, a bit low over you know, the thousands of parts in the vehicle. Um, ad additionally, they said that there were some parts that were changed out and were swapped after certification, and that certification is at 2248 kilos. So that's where the 180 kilos goes. So my concern there is this is a lightly specced and trimmed vehicle. If we'd have added more stuff on top like you can, they've got an incredible list of, um, of trim levels and, and option packs, you would keep losing payload. So you've got to keep an eye on that. In reflection, maybe we should have had the aluminium wheels. We could have had a bit more payload there. So that's the first issue. And to give that a bit of context, if we have a look at this table down here. So this is just a bit of an estimation of what the types of loads that we would expect to go into the vehicle for touring. So, yep, we measured two, four, 30 kilos on the scales. We added some um, two people and luggage. So I think I gave 80 kilos a person there and about 10 kilos of luggage. So that'd be you know, stuff that you carry on into the car with you, water bottles, stuff like that. Genuine bull bar and winch, that's a number from um, Land Rover themselves. That's the steel bar with the winch fitted. A genuine roof rack from the horse's mouth. Um, a bit of an estimate of recovery gear, so maybe a uh, snatch strap, um, a set of match tracks on the roof rack, that type of thing. The 350 kilos of ball load, because like I said earlier, our use case is maximum towing capacity. Three and a half ton tow vehicle in Australia. We use 10% ball weight, so that's 350 kilos. And then a tire upgrade. So these are actually pretty decent tires on the vehicle, but if you're going bush, it's pretty common that you'll upgrade the tyres and typically with the light truck construction and the higher sidewall plies, the tyres do get heavier and it adds up quite quickly. That's what that 25 kilos is. So that 3104 is kind of how that stacks up. So that is very close to the 3150 GVM. And the reason this is particularly important on this vehicle is you can't do a GVM increase on a monocoque chassis. So this this doesn't have a traditional ladder frame chassis like we're used to, used to seeing on four wheel drives. It's, it's, it's monocoque unibody, so it doesn't have a separate chassis. And according to the modification laws, you can't do a GVM increase for it. So now I completely understand that the other vehicles in the market, Land Cruiser 200 uh, specifically, um, doesn't have a big payload either. And that is a fault of the vehicle, however, the difference is you can GVM increase a Land Cruiser, but you can't on the new Defender. Now, I feel like there is a bit of wiggle room for the Defender, because if you have a look at the, um, the list that Land Rover produce on axle capacities and GVMs for their different variants, 
there's a whole range of them and this isn't the highest one. I approached Land Rover and said, hey, can we, um, can we get some leniency and apply the higher GVMs to this vehicle? And they said no, and they gave a pretty average response why we can't. So there, there might be some room to move there in the future, but that is the main issue why this vehicle is a problem with its payload. The second part of the whole weight issue with uh, Land Rover we touched on in the last video, and that's the rear axle capacity. So down here we've got our, got our nice caravan and defender. And on the last video you saw we put a caravan on and we had a, a ball weight here of 330 kilos. And then I sat in it, in the, in the defender, and we weighed it. The front axle came out at 1,098 kilos and the rear axle we weighed at 1,750 kilos. So the reason for that is because the ball weight pushes down on the back, it lifts a bit of load off the front and sticks it on the back axle. And from memory, it was 1.57 for the, for the maths nerds out there. So it was not purely the 330 which goes on the back axle. So as you can see from the, from the table at the top here, that 1,750 kilos very close to the um, maximum axle capacity of the vehicle. Now for measurement's sake we chucked another person in in the Defender in the front seat and we got 1,810 kilos on the rear axle so the vehicle actually went over its rear axle capacity. Now the important thing about that is strictly that would mean this vehicle is illegal and you can't tow it and if you had an accident potentially the insurance company would not back you. Now I'm not saying that this is um, the same on every Land Rover because obviously my sample size isn't very big, I've only got the one car to test with. However, trim variance, number of seats and stuff like that will affect this number. The main point of putting this out there is for people to be aware of it if they're looking at purchasing this vehicle or to say I've already purchased this vehicle and are looking at towing with it. It's just something you need to be aware of. So we had a third weight concern with the new Defender. When I was um, originally going through the specs I kind of glanced over it, it said 350 kilo ball weight which is about right for our towing capacities here in Australia. Later on when I got all, all tied up in the, um, the axle capacities and the, the GVMs and stuff like that, I realised there was some small print on the Land Rover website and on that it said on vehicles with overrun brakes, you could have a 350 kilo ball weight, otherwise it was 150 kilos. So that didn't make any sense to me because the majority of what we tow in Australia is electric brakes over two tonnes, which is the cutoff in GTM of overrun to electric brakes, if you care. Um, so I started digging into this. I contacted the dealer, I contacted the Australian Land Rover customer service people who I think are in Melbourne. And after two weeks I still couldn't get both parties to agree on what the actual ball weight of the Defender was. Because to me 150 kilos didn't make sense with this type of vehicle. Eventually I managed to get in contact with the managing director of JLR Australia. And to his credit, he answered the question really quickly. He got right on top of it and gave me an answer. And their interpretation is electric brakes classify as overrun brakes. Now, I don't agree with the, um, with the sense of that and the, and the theory behind it. However, they came out of that saying the car can have a 350 kilo ball weight. The reason I wanted to mention this is it's less about you know, what the result was and more about how long it took to get an answer on something seemingly simple from a technical perspective through the Land Rover network. If I didn't happen to be able to get to the top, I might still not have an answer. And I might have had to sell the vehicle because I thought it could only have 150 kilo ball weight. So, you know, moving on and, um, you know, if we were taking a take this on a bush trip, maybe around the country, to me, it's important to know that if I go to a Land Rover dealer and I have technical questions or I have technical issues with the car, because let's be honest, we're going to beat them up, stuff's going to happen. We need to be able to have timely responses. I can't wait two and a half weeks for answers. 
So I just wanted to put that forward as a potential thing to um, look into. So it feels like I've been a bit hard on the Defender so far. So what has life been like living with the Defender? Day to day, the vehicle has been excellent. It's super comfortable, it's easy to drive. It stops like a race car. Um, my wife in particular loves how comfortable it is. So um, we've owned it for it would be now six months, uh, about six months now. And um, I can't really talk about reliability yet because I don't think we've owned it long enough and I don't want to say the thing is unreliable or anything like that. A bit unfair, but um, I can give you a bit of a story of the one issue we have had with the Defender. And that's all about the battery system in it. So when we first got the car, it, um, if you say left the car overnight, you'd come out in the morning and it would say on the dash, battery voltage low, start the car within three minutes or it's gonna turn itself off. I contacted the dealer and they said, um, don't really worry about it. It's probably a battery within the head unit of, of the car um, that's called a PIVI Pro. Um, is the, the software in the, in the Defender. So I didn't, didn't think much more about it. I thought it was just sort of idiosyncrasies of um, a new vehicle. However, about two weeks after we took delivery of it, I threw my mountain bike in the back of it to head out to the bush, get some exercise, and the car didn't start. It was completely flat. So I thought I'd give this infamous Land Rover Assist a call. They sent a guy out. He tested the battery, said, so agree, super low, it's not going to start. I uh, said, okay, new car, we best stick a new battery in. And he said, oh, we don't carry batteries for this vehicle. Land Rover Assist, don't carry a new battery for the new Defender. And it's not a standard kind of N70 frame size like we see in most four wheel drives these days. It's a special European size shared with Volkswagen, I think, and other Land Rover models. He didn't have one. He did manage to jump start it using two jump start packs of a, a standard vehicle one and a truck one. That's how dead the battery was. And he said, you're gonna to have to take it to the dealer and get them to look at it. So that was annoying, but at least the car was going again. We got it into Land Rover um, in the city here. They had it for a week. I'm trying to find out what the issue was. In the end, they replaced the battery and supposedly reflashed the CAN gateway. Um, on the vehicle, and apparently that was causing it to draw too much current. Um, just to digress, before um, Land Rover had it, I had a bit of a play around with it. I got the clamp meter on the battery term on the battery cable, see if I could figure out what was going on. And I found if you um, unlock the car, open the door, and then shut it, it had a parasitic drain of about 10 amps continuously for um, for a decent period of time. Which would, which would definitely over time um, kill the battery. Um, doesn't really make sense to me. And maybe a potential issue if you are camping with the vehicle, opening and shutting doors, stuff like that, you might drain the battery. Anyway, so they reflashed the CAN gateways and off I went. It didn't appear to fix the issue to start with. However, it's had a couple of, I think they call them over the air updates. So it downloads off your phone into the car and when you pull up to work, you switch the car off and lock it, and it, um, and it does a software update. We had a couple of those now, and it hasn't, uh, hasn't come back. So I'm hoping that problem is fixed. Um, so yeah, that was our, my only real I mean, experience with the reliability of the vehicle. Um, it's probably worth touching on here, service network. Um, for those who've looked into it, it's probably nothing new, but the Land Rover network isn't particularly big throughout the country. Uh, that is Land Rover specific service centers. There are third party places around the play, around the country. Um, so if you are genuinely heading bush, spending quite a bit of time um, out west, you need to, consider, um, need to consider that. And that also has an influence on parts. So if you, if you break something, unlike um, the other major brands like Toyota, where most places have got a, a dealer, um, it might be quite hard to get parts. Whether that's a problem for you in a new vehicle is, is yet to be seen. However, it might just mean you have to stay at a particular town for a, a week or something until you can get the parts sent out. Just something to bear in mind about the new vehicle.
I thought we'd have a lap around the Defender now, go around the outside, have a look at the interior. And, and I just wanted to point out a few things I like, a few things I don't like on the, on the 110. So under the bonnet here, there's a couple of things. Over on the driver's side, there's a couple of high current battery connections. The battery's actually under the driver's seat, um, a bit like the old Defenders. So it's really good that they've considered, um, you might want to put a winch or something under here and they're giving you somewhere to put the cables to. Um, at the front of the car there, there is, um, there's actually two air intakes in, in down here. On the left hand side it just passes through, on the right hand side there's actually a little heat exchanger behind there, which I think is for hot climates but I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, um, it is slightly exposed, so if you are say overtaking someone on a gravelly road or something like that, um, I'd be concerned that it might get a random rock in there and it might punch through the radiator and that could be a problem. Um, whether that actually turns out to be an issue in practical application, I'm not quite sure yet. Just something I wanted to mention. Um, under the front there, there's a few bits of plastic. Um, one of them you take off and there's a pretty stout towing eye under there, which I think you're allowed to use for recovery. The only thing you need to think of is that before you go somewhere where you might need to recover the vehicle, you need to take that cover off because it's not very easy to do and not something you want to be doing if you're stuck in a mud bog or something like that. Over on this side of the engine bay is the airbox. This is a particular bugbear of mine, but the lid on the airbox is attached to the base of the airbox using screws. And from what I can tell, pulling it apart is there big long screws with a coarse thread that actually screw into the plastic of, of the lower half of the airbox. My concern is over time, you're going to damage the thread in the lower half. Now, it probably isn't a big issue if you don't take it bush and you're sticking to the service interval, which is something crazy like 30,000 kilometers in between services. So it's actually not gonna get used that much. However, if you're using it in the bush and you're traveling on dusty roads, it's pretty common that you'll be taking the air filter out and giving it a blowout quite frequently. On our trip, as we're traveling in convoy, we're doing it every couple of days to make sure we've got good air going to the engine. Um, particularly on these high output four cylinders, it's really important to get um, unrestricted clean air to them. So um, checking that regularly is very important. Uh, other, other than the fact that it's time consuming, you might damage the air box. I have a paranoia that I might drop a screw into the ball dust and then lose it and then it's not sealing properly. So um, I, I don't particularly like that on the vehicle. Moving along, we have the TPMS system, the tire pressure monitoring we talked about in our off-road video. Uh, if you do drop the tires down from the road pressures to um, something you might use for the beach or dirt roads, something like that, it comes up on the dash and says there's an error and you can clear it. However, every time you start the car, it comes back again. I think that's a bit annoying and considering it is a vehicle that supposedly is designed for off-road, that should be something you can maybe put an off-road um, tire pressure parameter in there so you don't keep getting the warning all the time. Uh, the air suspension on this vehicle is incredible. The ride is fantastic and the fact that you can lift it up to clear off-road obstacles, I believe is really useful. Um, if you have a look under here in the wheel arch, each corner has got a ride height sensor so it knows where it is within its travel and it adjusts accordingly. Um, particularly at the front, I think they're quite exposed and run the risk of being damaged. Um, so how, I did think, well, what happens if we break one? Does it throw something up on the dash? So we disconnected one and took it for a drive and it appears not to be a problem, it keeps going. So kudos to Land Rover for thinking of that. Um, mirrors, so we, I brought this up in our towing video of the Defender and we had a couple of comments um, saying we'll just fit towing mirrors if you don't have enough um, range of vision with the standard ones. And that's all well and good, however, there's about three sensors under here. So there's, a, I think there's a couple of cameras, there's a few around the vehicle that are used for doing the surround view on the screen inside as well as there's an ultrasonic sensor for wading height and stuff like that as you're going through water. 
So all those types of sensors you need to remove out of these mirrors and then they'd end up in an aftermarket mirror from someone like MSA. And that is a bit of a problem. It's complicated to move those and allow them to keep functioning. Um, as it is on the, I think the VX and Sahara Land Cruiser 200, MSA don't have an option for that yet because of the complication of putting the single camera housed in a 200 series mirror into them. So something to be aware of. Secondly, the other option for towing mirrors is a clip-on. I don't really like them because they they've, um, fall off on heavy corrugations, but nevertheless, if you clip one on here, you'll end up obscuring the cameras. I'm not quite sure what that's going to mean, whether it's going to come up with errors, but it's going to affect the functionality of the vehicle. That's why I brought it up in the last video. Heading around the back of the vehicle now, um, tow bar height is something that I covered off in our towing video. Um, I find it's quite low in comparison to other vehicles out there. So if you're going to tow an off-road trailer, um, check that video out and give you a bit more information. Um, whilst we're on the outside of the car, there's um, pretty decent underbody guards on this vehicle. Up the front, there's a series of three or four, I think. Up the front, aluminium plates um, stacked, and they're, they're pretty strong. As well as the whole underbody of the vehicle is well tucked, so there isn't really exhaust pipes or components hanging low on it, so really good for um, hardcore off-road use, you're not going to get hung up on anything. Right, so I'm going to head on to the inside of the vehicle now and show you a few things in there. All right, back here in the Defender, um, rear door is pretty cool, it's got a soft close function. Um, I'm not quite sure whether it's a mechanical or electronic uh, method of how it does it. But regardless, um, if the battery does go flat, we found out that the rear door doesn't open, which is a bit of a pain. I can't find a mechanical means of overriding that yet, and um, Land Rover didn't know at the time. So um, that's going to be a bit of a concern. Now, in the back here, the main reason that we're here um, is the space. Now, it wasn't um, something we picked up straight away, but um, I was chucking all the baby stuff in the back of the car to head down to the shops. I actually found it's pretty small back here. I think it's slightly smaller than my wife's RAV4, but certainly that's how it felt putting all the stuff in. Um, so with a fridge in the back, this is a CFX50 uh, Waco, you can see it actually takes up quite a lot of the rear cargo area. A lot of that is due to this big radius here. So to push this further over, you need to kind of lift it up 100 mil and that all seems like a bit of a nightmare. Um, so if you're going to use this vehicle for your overlanding without a trailer, it's something to note that there isn't a lot of cargo space at the back for all your gear for the trip. Just to give you a bit of perspective, I'm just going to rip the fridge out, throw it in the back of a 200 we've got here and just um, show you the difference in the size. All right, so in the back of the 200 here, you can see the volume difference in the boot. And considering this isn't factory, this is an aftermarket thing that we've built that houses the batteries there, there is substantially more space in here. In the Defender, the fridge was pushed to the back of the seat, the same as we've done here, and it only just fit. So if you want to run a bigger fridge in your vehicle, it's going to be a bit restricted in the Defender. All right, up the front of the Defender, the interior trim um, appears to be super high quality. It's been tough. Um, it can mark a little bit easily on some of the soft, um, the soft surfaces. However, the quality of the vinyl floor is pretty impressive. In comparison to say the 70 that I had before, they've done a really good job of masking the fact it has got a vinyl floor. Um, so the, it still has a quality feel, but you get the practicalities of that material. Particularly down here where the kick panels all fit in and they line up with the vinyl from the floor. It's really tight fitting, so you can literally sweep the sand out of this and it doesn't get stuck anywhere. Um, as we were pulling it apart, because we put a brake controller into this, the trim clips, are, um, they're really tough, big metal ones. Um, so there's no real... Um, panel rattle after you pulled the stuff apart. You have to be very careful though, because in a couple of places, the fit is so tight, we did break a couple of bits of plastic along the way. Uh, from the practicalities of modifying this for overland travel, um, switch blanks is really important for things like compressors and lights and all that type of stuff. 
And this whole car, we got one switch blank, which is down here. We've actually used it for mounting the electric brake controller, the Red Arc Tow Pro, but there isn't anywhere else. So there's gonna to have to be an aftermarket solution to put any lights in this car without drilling horrible holes all over the place. As far as the brake controller is also concerned, it, there's, a, um, there's a really nice method of installation in this vehicle. There's a factory plug that they've provided and you can get a loom from Red Arc. You literally clip one side into the loom, you clip the other side into the Tow Pro, and off it goes. We don't have to go and run wires and all that type of stuff. It's all ready to go, all fused. It's, an, it's a really good idea and more vehicles should do it. We made a little bracket up on our plasma cutter here that allowed us to mount the Tow Pro to it and then fix it the factory bolts under there. There's actually really neat installation in this car. One of the things I really love about this car is the 360 degree cameras on it. How they stitch it together, I have no idea, but the um, the quality of what you can see is excellent. One of the best features of this car. The in-car entertainment system in general is also a very good quality. Have had multiple issues with the CarPlay system, um, integrating with the phone. Some days it just doesn't want to work, other days it's flickering green. They really need to get that sorted because they've got aftermarket head units in other vehicles that um, perform far better than this. And I'm sure more money's been spent on this system. So we've gone over lots of points of the Defender and it might come across that I dislike it and that is not the case at all. I think it's an unbelievable vehicle. Uh, we've taken it off-road, low range stuff, on the sand and it, it's, uh, it is unbelievable. It is a really capable vehicle. However, for our intended use for our remote area testing trips, you can't put a three and a half ton van behind it and put some stuff in the car. It's just, on this particular vehicle, the numbers don't stack up. So uh, where does it fit? Um, I believe perhaps if you want to do that overlanding type of thing, but with a two ton trailer, it does make sense. Or probably for the majority of people who don't do that type of trip, if you want to four wheel drive for you know, traveling around town and do the occasional off-road trip, uh, Fraser Island, Morton, that type of thing, there's no doubt this vehicle is much better to live with on a daily basis than the other options out there. It is more comfortable, it uses less fuel, it's got better handling dynamics, it stops like my Evo. No, it's, it is a really good car. And so, you know, that's, if you don't have to tow that three and a half ton type of thing, not a major problem. So, um, where to next for the Defender with us? Uh, as, it, as it doesn't really work for us from the weight point of view, we are going to move it on shortly. Have considered um, buying it personally for my wife to take the kids to school. I know that's a bit of a cliche for a Land Rover, but it might, it might be where it ends up. Who knows? Hopefully I get a good deal. Um, so we have bought a replacement to it. Actually, we've got two replacements for our remote area testing fleet. We're not going to tell you about them now. We've got tons of videos of the build up of those coming out soon. Um, if you've liked this series that we've done on the Defender and our impressions on it off-road and um, towing and that type of thing, let us know in the comments. I'm keen to hear because we, we can do more of that if it's, if it's valuable for people. So keep an eye out on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram to make sure you don't miss out on our future content.